I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event uh, on the future of education in Detroit. Our goal today is to begin what I hope will be a series of conversations about the recent successes as well as the continuing challenges in preparing the young people of Detroit for the 21st century. Uh, today's panel represents one, one aspect, one perspective on this conversation. Um, in particular, each of our panelists today work outside what some might consider the traditional public school structure in Detroit, and in different ways have been pressing for substantial changes in the approach to schooling in the city. So we plan to hold additional events on this topic in the coming months, which highlight other perspectives on the future of education in Detroit. Um, and for today, we welcome questions that challenge the perspectives offered by our panelists here. Uh, and so then, going right to introducing those panelists. We have uh, three distinguished speakers um, today. To my, to my right, immediate right, is Dan Varner, CEO of Excellent Schools Detroit, followed by Tom Willis, CEO of Cornerstone Charter Schools, and Veronica Conforme, Interim Chancellor of the Education Achievement Authority. Um, I'm going to just do a, a brief introduction of each of them, uh, and then when they speak, they'll each be speaking for 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up to a uh, more general Q&A. Um, but before I, uh, uh, before I forget, I want to make sure I thank uh, some of the great staff who have helped put this together, Mahima Mahadevan and Julie Montero de Castro, as well as the other folks working at EPI, um, and the folks at the School of Education um, as well. Uh, also, I'd like to recognize um, Charles and Susan Gessner for their generous support of this event. Um, and uh, for the, the audience here, the way we're going to do Q&A is um, you can write questions on note cards, then kind of get the attention of one of the uh, staff here. They'll collect them, and then um, I'm going to kind of you know, go through them, collate questions on similar topics, and kind of read them uh, to the appropriate uh, panelist. Um, uh, for anyone following uh, via the web, you can also uh, send questions via email um, or Twitter. So email is edpolicyford uh, at umich.edu. And this is our hashtag for uh, tweeting us questions. Um, so I think that's it for the logistics. So I'm going to introduce our speakers, and we'll be, we'll be on our way. Um, so Dan Varner is the CEO of Excellent Schools Detroit, a, a coalition of philanthropy, educators, civic organizations, and community-based organizations uh, working to ensure that every Detroit student cradle to career receives an excellent education by 2020. Um, he is also, also the co-founder and former CEO of a nationally recognized award-winning uh, youth development organization called Think Detroit. Tom Willis, uh, to his right, is CEO of Cornerstone Charter Schools, which currently directs four charter schools, one of which, uh, Madison Carver Academy, uh, was recently named as one of 31 top schools in Detroit by Excellent Schools Detroit. Um, he's a Michigan native and a U of M uh, alumni. Um, prior to joining Cornerstone, he worked for Intel uh, and Price Waterhouse Coopers. And then last but not least, uh, Veronica Conforme, uh, who is still the uh, interim superintendent of Education Achievement Authority, I, I hear, uh, despite uh, uh, you know, a, a meeting this, this, uh, this afternoon that uh, didn't have a quorum. Um, the Education Achievement Authority of Michigan was created to turn around the academic performance of students in the state's lowest achieving schools. Uh, the EAA is in its second year of operating 15 schools in Detroit. Um, Veronica was previously the uh, Vice President of the College Board's Access to Opportunity Campaign and served as the Chief Operating Officer of the New York City Department of Education. So uh, without further ado then, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dan Varner who will begin uh, the presentations. All right. Thanks, Brian. Um, and special thanks to uh, our hosts here at the university. I'm a, uh, Brian didn't mention that I'm a two-time graduate of the University of Michigan undergrad in law school, so go blue. Um, I know we've got some green and white in the audience, but uh, I'm going to um, stay true to my colors. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, it's great to be here with you today. I've only got 15 minutes, uh, so I'm going to jump right into it. I'm just going to grab my bottle, my, my water, so that I can have it. 
All right, um, so let's jump into it. Uh, so this is actually titled Detroit's Public Education System for a reason. Um, it, DPS used to be Detroit's Public Education System. The education, you could actually call it Detroit's Education Systems. Uh, there are many of them, I'll get into that momentarily. So, um, and can I take this full screen? Let me see if I can do that real fast. There, is that better? Yeah. Um, so this was Detroit's public education system circa 1990, right? Lots of Detroit public school schools and lots of private schools that Detroit kids went to. Um, as population decreased and state law changed, that landscape started changing dramatically. So here's what it looked like in 2000 with the advent of charter schools. And here's what it looks like today. Part of the point of this slide is to understand that Detroit does not have one system anymore, it has 12. Uh, and we're talking about the systems that are run by Detroit Public Schools, by the Education Achievement Authority, and by all of the active charter school authorizers, 10 public universities that are active in Detroit, as well as DPS and the EAA. And let me be clear about one thing. I'm actually gonna talk about uh, governance of schools, uh, largely. Governance and public policy surrounding schools, largely. I am not gonna get into curriculum, like so I'm not a teacher, uh, never have been. Um, and although I am the uh, child of a teacher, um, certainly not qualified to talk about what makes for effective teaching or curriculum or what have you. Um, so I'm really interested in um, what makes for effective governance. Really quickly, one other caveat about that, and that is that effective governance doesn't equal good teaching, obviously. I would argue, though, that any any good curriculum, teaching, whatever, doesn't have a chance of succeeding if you've got bad governance in place and bad policy in place. And that's because schools won't ever have enough money with which to operate. Schools, the system that they're operating in will be so unstable that talented folks won't choose to stay in it, and on and on and on. So I wanna lay the groundwork for what is wrong with public education governance in Detroit and offer a proposed solution for that. All right, so 12, does that, does that get rid of that? If I click that, anyone know? Yeah. <laughs> Good enough, all right. So 12 public, um, uh, 12 school systems in Detroit. Each one of them operates by their own rules around deciding when to open a school, when to close a school, where to open a school, where to close a school. Um, what level of family support to provide? Some provide transportation and busing, some don't provide transportation and busing. So they're all wildly independent, although they are regulated at the state level. So here's the metaphor. Uh, it's like there are 12 drivers on a road. And let's say that they're driving school buses to make the metaphor really clear and all of those school buses have kids on them, right? Every one of those bus drivers decides where to park on their own, which side of the road to drive on on their own, what speed to go on their own, right? And there's no organizing mechanism for them. And as you can imagine, kids and schools get hurt in that process, right? Some park in the middle of the street and somebody's speeding down the middle of the street, um, which is why we land with that metaphor. All right. So what, is that, like, so what does that look like in practice? In practice, we've got way too many schools. Um, so you'll notice, if we go back to these slides, right, that this is something like 370 schools. Um, and I don't have the math in front of me, but this is 230 schools. Detroit's population fell way, like much more than the corresponding reduction in schools. Um, Nobody actually knows what the real capacity of every school building is. I mean, the only way to do it is to actually find out from the fire marshal what the fire marshal coded capacity in all of those school buildings are. Um, if you think about it from a practical perspective, schools can add teachers or reduce their teaching staff based on enrollment changes as long as they have capacity in the building. So the actual capacity of the building is the max capacity for any school, individual school, and add that all up for the districts. Um, the point is that given today's population, we've got way too many schools, way too many schools. The consequence of that is that most schools are under-enrolled. Most are, it, it's driven in part by state policy around financing, but in addition, because of enrollment, most schools are under-enrolled. Um, and don't, as a result, because money follows kids, don't have enough money to actually do anything well. One, two, DPS has been in financial distress for the better part of two decades. Like, 
real significant financial distress for the better part of two decades, and 50,000 kids go to school in Detroit public schools. It's not good for anybody. Three, because nobody's in charge of all the charter school actors, bad actors in that system behave poorly. So quick example, in the last year, I think we've had five charter schools in Detroit that have changed authorizers. Right? Five that have changed authorizers. Now, there are a number of authorizers that are opposed to this, but all you need is one authorizer. Let me back, let me explain this. So a, a good authorizer puts pressure on a charter school to improve its performance. That charter school has a bunch of options. We can get better, or under current state law, we can switch authorizers and go to somebody who's not gonna hold us accountable for performance, right? Five schools did that in the last year, I think three of them specifically because they were getting pressure from their authorizer to perform at a higher level, chose to go to a different authorizer. Fourth, the EAA. So lots of state money now being put into this entity and 70 million in philanthropy being put into this entity, um, struggling to survive. Why? Because you were running two different plays. So on the one hand, the governor says, let's put a lot of money into an entity designed to turn around the, the most troubled, most difficult schools that we have in the state and start in Detroit. And on the other hand, the legislature uncaps charter schools, unleashing a marketplace designed to close the very same schools that the governor is saying, let's put a lot of money into, right? Doesn't make sense. Fifth, as a result of that, school quality is bad across the landscape. So let's explore that a little bit. Red is bad, green is good, meaning performing a below and above the 50 percentile mark on uh, MEEP for the state or on the, the whatever the, the test is as we go through these slides. So these are MEEP reading scores for Detroit. Oh, by the way, the blank squares and circles tend to mean that the school doesn't actually take the MEEP, maybe because it's a high school, and of course high schools in the state take ACT and not MEEP, or a private and independent school, or such a small school that its results aren't counted. Um, so these are all the schools, all the red schools in the city that are performing below 50% on MEEP. And the green are the ones performing above uh, that mark. Here's math, no better. Here's the top to bottom ranking. So the state organizes every school, right, and ranks them top to bottom by performance across the state. So green, top 50 percentile, red, bottom 50 percentile. Once again, way more red than green. And we're not getting any better. So if we quickly look at the trend lines, sorry that the typeface here is small, but students aren't making measurable progress. And if you look at the larger data around students in the city, um, the trend lines around math, reading, and ACT performance aren't getting any better. And if you look at it by governance type, it doesn't really matter by governance type either. Charters, DPS, EAA, schools are all performing pretty mediocrely. The only, about the only thing you can pull out of this slide is that some of the independent schools, there are more stars toward the top than the bottom, right? So some of the independent and private schools are doing well which you would expect because those families have the means to send their kids to private school, right? And or so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so last slide on this. Boy, I hope this is the right deck. Yep, it is. Okay, so who's in charge? Really quickly, this, gets, this starts to tee up what I would propose as a solution. So the mayor in Detroit controls nothing. The Detroit Public Schools Board of Education controls nothing. The state legislature controls state policy and finance, right? The Michigan Department of Education enforces, and by virtue so of the State Board of Education, of which I'm a member, by the way, and I should, so I should disclaim, I should be clear, I'm talking here in my capacity as CEO of Excellent Schools Detroit. I'm not, um, uh, while I might feel personally strongly about what I'm about to suggest, uh, it's not written, risen to the level of a conversation at the state. Um, I really am talking about Detroit uh, in this particular instance. So the State Board of Education hires a state superintendent who runs the Michigan Department of Education. That entity or those folks are responsible for regulatory enforcement of the policy that the state legislature develops and for compliance with federal requirements, which is attached to, typically to money that the feds um, provide for education that passes through the Michigan Department of Education. Lastly, interestingly, the governor controls quite a bit. He appoints the DPS emergency manager, appoints the board of the Education Achievement Authority, and appoints, thank you, uh, the boards for all of the charter school authorizers. So here's my proposal. Um, a possible future for governance of public education in Detroit. There is going to be a reset, I firmly believe. Now, 
I don't have inside information on this, but when you look at the kind of aligning of all the stars, I think there is just going to be a reset. Um, and here's what I, here I think are the priorities that need to govern that reset. First, you've got to have equitable and accessible schools, right? So I believe in school choice. I want to be clear about that. And I believe in it because I think that as a nation and a community, we're not serious about desegregating uh, housing patterns based on race and income. Um, and so we're basically forcing poor kids to uh, um, go to a bunch of, to a school where there are just a bunch of other poor kids there. Like, and let, can we concentrate poverty any more than we currently do? I, I suspect not. Um, given that fact, I think we've, the, and knowing that education and jobs are the pathways out of poverty, really the only two, um, I submit that kids and families, low-income families, have to be able to send their kids to schools elsewhere. They have to be able to have a choice around sending their kids to school just like anyone else. But that choice isn't real right now, right? So you and I get to decide where to send our kids to school, and we have the means to get our children there. Um, you've got to have, you've got to make it equitable so that if a family um, without the means wants to send their child to a high-performing school on the other side of town, they need the means to be able to do so. That needs to be publicly funded. Second, coordinated efficient management of the entirety of that public education system. You can't have 12 bus drivers driving by different rules, right? Traffic works when you make everybody drive on the right side and park in certain places and go a certain speed. Third, stable, sustainable system that supports talent. So once again, teachers, administrators, and so on don't stay in a system that is unstable. Let's create one that's stable enough so that talented people want to work in it and stay in it. And lastly, um, it needs to be publicly accountable. Uh, I really do believe that um, one of the greatest challenges that Detroit faces right now is the fact that uh, education in Detroit largely is not publicly accountable. There's just no way for Detroiters to hold schools accountable for performance. Now, I have strong opinions about the best mechanisms by which to hold leadership accountable. Um, that's a whole other conversation. I'm not going to get into it today. Um, but know that, uh, and I've, I, no, let me just let me just bite my tongue and stop there. I don't want to get down that path. All right. So here's what it would look like. A portfolio manager for the entire city of Detroit. And I, I don't see any way that we are going to govern public education in Detroit effectively unless and until we move in this direction. Um, multiple people driving the bus by different rules makes no sense. Under any circumstance, it doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you. Uh, so a portfolio manager who would do two things. One is around this accountability function, manage all school opening and closure decisions as well as school operator assignments. That means one charter school authorizer in the city of Detroit, right? The mayor. That's my proposal. Let me, let me not say that. So it could be lots of people. I think the mayor should be it. Um, uh, but it could be others. I completely get that it could be others. Let's just have the conversation about who is the right person for it. One authorizer, um, move all buildings, DPS and charter school buildings, to a portfolio. Why do we ask educators to be experts on real estate? It doesn't make any sense. Um, and lastly, uh, assessments and accountability managed locally in partnership with the Michigan Department of Education. Around school choice, uh, a second function for this office, and that is to make choice actual and equitable for all families. So a scorecard that makes clear the performance of schools, a common enrollment system so that there's a single window for enrolling in schools. I can game the system, because I know folks, right? That shouldn't be allowed. School enrollment should be transparent to everybody, right? And it should be done the way that we do other things with a simple algorithm to make sure that we're matching folks um, uh, blindly and transparently. Uh, and lastly, a common transportation system so that, that low-income family can get their child across town to that high-performing school. And here are the benefits of said um, portfolio management or air traffic controller or rules for the road or whatever you want to call it. You've got a responsive system for students and families. Teachers and school leaders have a stable and adequately funded system that supports them. Community partners have a predictable system with whom to partner. Detroiters have an educational system that's actually accountable to us. Uh, and student outcomes, I would argue, over time improve as we move bad schools and bad operators out of the system and uh, more quickly replicate good ones. My time is up. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon to everyone. Good evening, I guess, almost. Um, woo, I told Dan he was going to bring the room down a little bit with the facts and the details. And uh, I can only say that because Dan and I have been friends. He's much older than I am. We went to the same high school, but he's much, much older than I am. Um, <laughs> I, like Dan, am not a, uh, a career educator. Uh, in the introduction, I was a U of M engineer, actually, of all things. Um, uh, I've been very good at two things, picking a wife and picking good people to work with. And so part of what um, we're most excited about at Cornerstone is building the team that can really take on and try some new things. So part of what I'm going to talk about right now is not so much Detroit and its landscape, um, more about Detroit and what I think it can is becoming and, and can become. A lot of what Dan laid out there, I think um, we're signing up for as well. And I say that as an operator that has one school that is uh, very low performing and that we're in a turnaround model for. So uh, very willing to raise our own hand and be held accountable for that as well. <clears throat> so Detroit, um, how many of you have been to Midtown Detroit lately? Not downtown, not a Tigers game, that doesn't count. Midtown Detroit. So the Shinolas, the Willies, the, all the stuff going on there, the high occupancy. You know, it's, we're seeing the rebirth of, of a great American icon. This, this brand that is gold right now in this country is Detroit. And it's, it's awesome to see. Uh, I've been back in Detroit for about uh, 12 years now. And I can say that uh, having grown up here, uh, there's no time like now to see the, the future. But I think what's being left out of the conversation uh, for good, bad, otherwise reasons is what really matters, which is education. And I, I, I'm so excited that Dan and the, the work that they're doing with Excellent Schools Detroit is trying to bring a light to this that is so, so critical. Um, when you've got 80 plus percent of kids in failing schools in a city, that is just frankly unacceptable um, and so really excited about the rebirth of the city I think you know it's one of those cart before the horse types of pieces but we will not keep people good people in the city unless we've got good schools and so that's what we're trying to be about I know that's what Veronica is trying to be about is is helping to turn that city around we don't propose to have the solution we just want to be a part of it and um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the things that we're doing before I do that just a quick snapshot so we opened a new high school uh, two years ago, we're in our third year now. Um, we tested all the incoming ninth graders, or as we call them, beginners. Um, there was about 70 of them that came from 35 different middle schools. 70 kids from 35 different middle schools. So talk about uh, a little bit of the chaos that Dan's talking about. How do you create a culture when you've got that many different middle schools coming to you? Um, we tested them using uh, the map, uh, NWA's map, and here's just a quick pictorial of where they, they fell out, both in math and ELA. And as you can see, um, ELA, they were about a sixth grade average, and math competency was about fourth grade. These are ninth grade students, just unbelievable. We knew it was going to be tough. We knew it was going to be bad. But until you see it in black and white, um, it's hard to really uh, stomach. So um, that's just the reality of, 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 of the world that we're in. Um, so I want to talk about three things uh, kind of uh, quickly titled here yesterday, uh, Burden and a Blessing, uh, Collaboration and Innovation. And you notice what's not up there is really the, the core of what matters, uh, the basic blocking and tackling. As my counterpart at um, the Cornerstone Private School says, you've got to do all the basic blocking and tackling. You've got to hire good people. You've got to reward them. You've got to create a culture where people like, like each other and they like working together. Um, and you've got to have you know, amazing curriculum that gets better every year. So I'm not talking about any of that. Um, that's intentional. I'm trying to just talk about some of the other th things that are going on that may be of interest. So the first is you know, a little more burden with a tremendous blessing. The reality is, and especially in urban schools across the country, I think I'm blessed to be able to be a part of some groups. Uh, one of them was funded by the Gates Foundation. Um, and it, it's the same story. Um, I, I got into education. I was actually visiting a friend over in Tanzania, Africa, and I was there for a little bit teaching. And it, it hit me one day that kids are kids, no matter where they are in the world. Um, and the, the reality is the challenges are, are the same in most cities. Detroit's uh, unique in maybe the scope and the absolute um, challenges that we're facing as far as dropping uh, in, um, students and um, population. But at the core, it's still an, an urban city that has similar urban challenges. Um, so the burden is, is increasing. I think we're putting more and more as a society on schools. Um, the, the, the weight of, uh, of pressure on teachers. How many teachers are in this room? 
God bless you. This is um, a very, very tough time to, to go into this profession. Um, it's, uh, you know, long hours. The pay is not so good. Um, and the public pressure right now is just through the roof. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a tough, tough time. And I think the burdens that being placed, especially again in, a, in an urban environment on schools to do everything now is, is through the roof. But with that becomes, in our opinion, a great blessing where um, it's not just about the mind, it's about, in our case, the, the mind, body, and spirit. So um, we have got a great responsibility to how do we raise students that have great morals, great ethics. Um, in our, our case, we call them the 10, 10 character words, and these are not easy things to do, um, but we love that, that task and we love that challenge. Collaboration. Um, so we've got a partner program that actually extends way back to 20 some years ago when Cornerstone started. And it, it was really kind of a brilliant idea that um, was very counterintuitive. And in fact, one of the original founders said uh, that that idea is never going to happen. You're not going to get people to come into a city uh, that they are afraid of to spend time maybe with students they don't know, um, that with time that they don't have, and pay, for, you know, in this case, pay for the privilege. Um, in the, the charter school uh, world, we don't, we don't uh, charge for the privilege anymore, but we still keep the core of the program. So how do you connect the, the real world? How do you connect m mentors and adults into the students' lives to give them a vision beyond the small world and sometimes a very dark world that they, they live in? And I can tell you, this is what turned my life around when I went to one of these. Um, I, I partnered up with little Wesley Striggles. He was in kindergarten. He's now a freshman in college. Um, and just that simple relationship that we had over those years, I think uh, certainly I thought I was going to change his life, and what ended up happening is, is really he changed mine. Um, and it's, it's just a simple but very powerful relationship. And so if nothing else today, um, if you are looking for something to do that will truly change your life, uh, we'd love to have you, you know, as a part of our partner program. Another um, kind of actually partnership, collaboration slash innovation is, uh, that we're working on is trying to connect uh, students to the real world. Uh, the, the number one reason that, that students drop out is they don't, they don't see the purpose of school. It's uh, when their lives are so challenging at home, why am I bothering with algebra? <laughs> Help me understand that. Um, and so we've got to make that connection. And it could be a very simple thing. We took some students last a couple years, the name of our high school is the Health and Technology High School. So we took some of our students to Beaumont. Uh, they came back all fired up because they learned that pharmacists make six figures. Um, and you never know, that, that, simple, that simple light bulb that may have gone off, and even if it's just one student's head, could have changed their trajectory, could have changed their path. And so part of what our goal is is to, is to create those exposures, uh, ultimately, that may lead to internships, um, but really, even at the basic level of exposure. So we're working with uh, uh, one of uh, Dan Gilbert's um, companies called um, uh, Grand Circus. They do a lot of tech training, and uh, we're launching a pilot this, this spring that's all around sort of coding, getting kids into that world, um, creating partners with you know the Penske's of the world, the Plant Morans, um, the ZF Systems, trying to create that, that relationship so that students can see, okay, now I understand why I'm, I'm taking this class. Uh, blended learning, how many of you are familiar or have heard that term? Okay, so uh, it's a big topic. Uh, it's called many different things, personalized learning, blended learning. Um, the EAA is doing a lot of great work in this space as well. Um, the, the quick summary is really, um, how do you um, maximize a student's potential, especially in our case where they're coming to you at all different levels? How do you meet them where they are? in this case, leverage, leveraging technology. I think the technology is um, finally to the point, it's not very good, but it's finally to the point where it can be leveraged um, to try to meet students where they are. So you can have, um, let me jump ahead here real quick. So in a classroom like this, uh, which is one of our K-8s, you have a, a, what we call a three-station rotation. These little dots represent students. So you could have 30 students um, in kind of three different stations. The, the small group work where they're collaborating together, direct instruction with the teacher, which is kind of the, the holy grail for teachers, is to be able to work in these small groups. And then maybe 10 students working on, on computers, and all 10 of those kids could be working on a different math lesson. Um, I could be you know, learning how to add. Uh, uh, Dan could be learning how to subtract, et cetera. So uh, be able to meet them where they are. And then they rotate every 
maybe 30 or so minutes. Um, so it's about doing that. It's about mastery in our high school. We're trying to build the program so that kids can advance based on mastering, not, not a time-bound system. Um, so if they're able to fly through Algebra 1 in, in two and a half months because of uh, they've got the passion and the grit, then great. We don't need to hold them back. So trying to advance them based on that, that is very, very messy and very, very hard. So I will not tell you that we have all the answers. Um, and then individualized learning plans. So again, how do we meet students where they are, uh, not just in math and English, but across all the subject areas? This is a, a rendering of our new high school that we just opened. We, we moved them to a permanent location. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's very close to what it actually does look like, and you'll, you'll notice the intention here was creating more of a, a college sort of feel. Um, and all this is around trying to give students that, that vision for, for the future and, and some ownership. It's very, again, very challenging. Um, when we first started, we had this kind of choose your own adventure um, approach uh, that we thought, you know, ninth graders could just kind of jump in and say, oh, I'll just work on math for a half hour and maybe I'll try uh, history for the next half hour. Well, that didn't quite work. Um, so we've had to tighten it up a little bit, especially at the early levels, but it's amazing. Those kids that are in the third and fourth year, as we call them, uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced, and professional levels, it's amazing to see them finally taking ownership of this whole thing. And so to me, that's the power of blended learning. Um, I, I use myself as an example. I was halfway through my MBA at a university that will not be named in this room. Um, it's not in Ohio. Um, uh, and it occurred to me that, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm supposed to be learning things, uh, not just getting good grades. I was really good at getting A's, but I, I wasn't really focusing on learning things. So that light bulb finally went off for me, and that's part of what this is about, is trying to uh, get students at a much younger age to say the purpose of school is to learn um, and to be lifelong learners. So I just wanted to wrap up with a, a couple things here. Um, it's my new favorite uh, images here. So if you can't see this, it's, uh, it says, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. And this was from the president of the Michigan State Bank advising Henry Ford's lawyer not to invest in Ford Motor Company in 1903. Here's another one with some computers. I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM, 1943. And so I think this challenges us. We had a retreat a couple weeks ago with our team, about 170 employees, and I, I went through these plus about 10 others. And I said, what is that? What are they going to be saying about education in 10, uh, 50 years from now that we um, we think might be true, but we're not really willing to take that risk. Um, and it was amazing to hear what some of our, our teachers said. And, and, and we're trying to push the envelope when it comes to, to blended learning and these sorts of things. But, you know, I remember one of the teachers saying that uh, there, there won't be any more school buildings. You know, kids will just kind of learn anywhere, everywhere. And, and even for me, uh, that was a little bit hard to, um, to hear. And to, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that future, but who knows? It, it's, uh, it, it could be. Um, so I think it's exciting. There's, there's no doubt that um, there's good people that are they're working hard to try to make this happen and to, to ultimately be a part of rebuilding this great, great American city that is Detroit. Do you have one? So good evening. My name is uh, Veronica Conforme. It's an honor to be here today at the University of Michigan's uh, Ford School of Public Policy to discuss the future of education for Detroit. Uh, what an important topic. Um, let me start by saying that as someone who just moved to Detroit, uh, my interest and passion is about uh, making education uh, successful for our children, transforming lives and transforming the schools that are in our charge in the Education Achievement Authority. Um, I uh, spent over a decade at New York City public schools. Um, I was, uh, my culminating position was as Chief Operating Officer. And um, it's so fascinating to me to have our, my two fellow panelists talk about things that are very familiar to me. And so although my experience and context is from New York City, 
Um, I, I, we ran a portfolio district. We ran what was a portfolio model. The school district uh, did transportation, did school safety, did um, all of those things for charters and for uh, traditional public schools in New York City. So it's a very familiar uh, conversation to me and I'm excited uh, that Dan and others are launching into that uh, conversation to see uh, where we go from that. And, and as Tom said, we are equally eager to be accountable for student outcomes and for uh, the, the mission and purpose of, uh, of transforming education. So um, a couple of things. I think um, for background purposes, uh, the EAA was formed uh, through an interlocal agreement between Detroit Public Schools and Eastern Michigan. We run 15 schools, all in Detroit, uh, that were historically the struggling schools. Uh, the charge is to transform them, turn them around, improve achievement, and um, ultimately um, not stay in those schools forever. Um, there's uh, still a lot of questions about the, what the future becomes. Uh, I'm sort of excited that we have those questions because it should not be baked. It should be very much an engaging conversation with others about um, how we do this very, very hard work of transforming schools. Um, we have 7,700 students uh, from pre-K to 12. Uh, and uh, we run a model that is extended school year and extended school day, uh, meaning that our uh, Michigan's uh, school days are roughly 175. We run 205 days currently this year. Okay, so area, areas of concern, uh, many of them uh, coincide with what Dan said. Uh, and so what, what are we talking about? Um, so what I have found in the uh, four months as interim chancellor for the EAA is uh, we have lots of empty seats. We have an oversupply of seats in schools and an under demand of students. Um, we have, we, Detroit in the 1990s had 200,000 students that currently uh, educates 100,000 students, uh, and over half of those are educated in charter schools currently. Um, we don't have a coherent framework for accountability. Um, I would agree, I would say that Dan and Excellent Schools Detroit has uh, done a, a great job at starting that conversation, at creating uh, school progress reports so that parents can actually uh, understand more about quality and choice, because it's not choice for choice sake, it is choice to improve options, for real options for families. Um, I'm a big believer in choice. I, um, I attended one of these struggling schools uh, as I, when I grew up in the, in the South Bronx, and uh, that ultimately in that same environment where my junior high school was today are three uh, thriving schools. Two of them are traditional public schools and one of them is a charter and are creating much better options for families in that particular community. Um, on, on accountability, I think the things that we should be thinking about is um, how it has to be accountability for all, traditional and charter schools. Um, it needs to be straightly focused on how students are performing and student outcomes, and it needs to be a good solid framework that not only provides parents and the public with information about the school, but that indicates to the educators in all of the buildings what are the right next steps to start, start to solve some of those problems, to start to intervene uh, and to be able to measure whether those interventions are working in the long run. Uh, and finally, it has to be uh, about student interest. We must prioritize student interest above all. We talk a lot about governance uh, in Detroit in my short time there. We talk a lot about all of the adult actors, um, but 
we need to move away from that and really, really focus on what are the priorities for students and how do we serve them best. Um, I also would want to see much more conversation. Tom, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, just a few months ago, but uh, much more collaboration and cross-conversation among charters, EAA, DPS, et cetera. So just as a reference point, uh, Dan point to a lot of data associated with MEEP scores. Um, I took a, I've taken a look at the national data for Detroit, uh, and this is uh, our NAEP scores in Detroit, fourth grade math. Um, and what you see is that although Detroit is improving, it's the last line on the bottom, it is, uh, it is slow and improving, and other cities are improving faster, like Chicago, DC, and LA. And uh, these are representative, as we all know, fourth grade scores are the types of things that economists look at when they predict um, prison pipelines and other things. And so this, this is not only a statistic of where we are in terms of achievement, but um, the type of crisis that we are up against uh, in this great city. Okay, so, but there are some positive things, and I think, um, I think, like Tom, I want to talk about some of the positive things. How are we moving, are we moving in the right direction, and what are some of those things that are happening? I think that uh, parents are certainly more involved and starting to be more informed, and how do I see that? I see that from the partnership that we have with Detroit Parent Network. Um, I uh, just attended an event this Saturday. There were over 100 parents in attendance on a Saturday afternoon to talk about how important it is for parents to be involved in, in their children's education and uh, celebrating their involvement through a superhero theme. Uh, and I see those types of events happening all around and I see parents wanting to participate more in all of, um, in the conversation and in specifically uh, addressing some of the um, concerns that uh, schools may have. Parents are also, I, I spoke at this event and I said parents are, are students first teachers. And so how do we continue to empower them? Um, in our schools, we have a parent center in every one of the schools. They, um, they, they are equipped with computer and resources to support parents around job, um, job searches, resume building, et cetera, et cetera, other social service contacts. Um, we feel that as uh, an organization that is working with the most struggling schools, it is critical that we are supporting parents in this way. Um, the conversation's starting to change from quantity to quality, and I think um, some of Dan's remarks are really about that. Uh, lots of quantity, lots of seats, lots of schools, lots of options, different authorizers, um, lots of folks in the mix, uh, but how do we focus on quality? Uh, how do we ensure that uh, we are recruiting and retaining top talent in um, our organization, but in all schools across the city. Um, accountability, advocacy is growing. Um, to Dan's point, he's talking about this today. Um, he, he and others continue to push this conversation in Detroit, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that conversation as well. And I think one of the other priorities, at least for us, we are expanding our early childhood program at the EAA, it is um, expanding across the city. Um, we see that as a top priority, we know that it's worked in many other places where they have focused on uh, pre-K and early childhood programs. We're also opening um, this year uh, in November a uh, birth, to, uh, birth to four years old program for um, our our students who are teen parents um, to be able to bring their, their children to school. Uh, EAA, some of the other 
academic things that are going on specifically at the EAA. Um, in terms of academics, I mentioned year-round uh, programs. We have uh, reinvig reinvigorated our team to focus on all students, including our special education students and our uh, English language learners, uh, putting more resources. We doubled the number of special education teachers uh, this year at the EAA. Um, we have, we continue to plan to expand our pre-K offerings. In terms of data and accountability, three of the 15 schools are no longer on the priority list. Um, that's the priority list that's set by the state. So there is some progress. It is not fast enough and is in, and it in no way are where we, where we need to be, but it continues to move every day. Uh, safety and security. Um, we do lots of parent surveys and student surveys, and what we have found is that uh, one of the uh, key indicators is that safety and the culture in schools ha has improved um, over the past two years. Um, as we've uh, implemented some of the programs and, uh, and started with new leadership in many of the schools. Building relationships and uh, talent. Uh, let me focus on talent for a second. Um, we can't do this work if we cannot retain and support and provide the right professional development to teachers uh, and principals. And one of the things we're looking at is doing a full-on engagement this year with all of our teachers in every single school to devise a talent retention support uh, a strategy and uh, to ensure that we are able to keep um, our best performing teachers in the EAA. There is a lot of work to be done. I want to also invite any of you to visit our schools uh, at any time. Uh, we have an open door policy. We, we do get lots of visitors. Um, some of it comes from the blended learning uh, approach of other people wanting to see that work, but um, we certainly have our doors open for anybody to come visit. Thank you. Okay, well thanks to all uh, of our panelists. Um, and so we're not going to start the Q&A. Um, please, if you have questions, write them down in the note card. And Mahima, are you, you and, OK, the people in the back who are raising their hands are ones to uh, collect the note cards. I, while we're waiting for some of the note cards to come in, I want to start off with the first question. Um, I'm going to take the, the moderator's prerogative. Um, and I'd like to ask you know, all of the panelists about this portfolio management system. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I, on one hand, kind of, I'm, my personality makes me naturally attracted to kind of order and linearity and all those wonderful things that, <laughs> you know, apparently do, doesn't exist in Detroit now. But when I hear you talking about a coordinated system of opening schools, closing schools, intervening in schools, providing school accountability, providing transportation, structuring enrollment, that sounds a lot like a public school district. Right, and that sounds like, uh, so what is, what different is that? How is that different than the old DPS where they were doing that, maybe not as well as they could be? What, what, what is the, the key to portfolio management and making that different than the traditional urban school district um, and making it effective? Um, so I'll jump on that one, uh, and I should, I actually failed to do this at the top of my remarks and, and meant to, uh, there, uh, it, I um, said to Professor Arson uh, from Michigan State before we got started that um, 
it was really odd to me that I was up here and he was in the audience. I felt like that should have been reversed. And looking out, I now see tons of other folks who should be up here uh, while I listen to them. So Chris Wygen from Wayne Risa and Carrie Moss at the ACLU and uh, RJ Weber at Novi Public Schools and professors from Wayne State and on and on and on. So my apologies for not acknowledging all of you uh, at the very top. Um, oh, and I should say as well, a uh, colleague from the State Board of Education, Michelle Fecto. Um, so two things, uh, two big buckets. One is, I just, so a lot of people hear that question and think, well, why can't we just go back to DPS? And I would just argue that the cat's out of the bed, like the genie's out of the bottle, right? Um, the notion of going back to DPS is so, I don't even know how you would do that at this point um, in a city where 50% of kids go to charter schools. Those parents are, um, like you're asking, you're, you're effectively taking that choice away from those parents, so on and so forth. I just think that politically and practically that doesn't make any sense. So, so really I hear that question as, okay, well how, how really is portfolio management different from having a central district? Um, and the truth is it doesn't have to be. Now it's very different from what it was in Detroit two decades ago, right? You didn't have school choice in Detroit two decades ago. Um, uh, and so it's not the same system as it would have been in Detroit two decades ago. But in many respects, it does mimic some of the same um, uh, uh, um, economies of scale that you get with a district, right? Providing transportation for all schools is very similar that, as what you would do with a district. Um, a singular, um, uh, singular control over opening, closing, and siting decisions makes a lot of sense. Some of the additional benefits, I would argue, are that you actually have more actors involved in innovation. Um, I think that having a single district um, puts a lot less pressure on that entity, or there's a lot less interest among actors at that entity to actually try different things um, with education, and having many actors helps to spur innovation as long as it's coordinated. So uh, that's probably not a comprehensive answer, but just a couple of examples of how it's simil both similar and different. Any other panelists like to respond? It's his idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, you could probably look at New Orleans as probably an example where they have both. They have the um, choice and different options, mm -hmm. but there is a, a chief at the top of the food chain. And so I think ultimately that's what Dan's talking about. If you, if you distill the idea down to that simple concept, right now it is like the Wild West. There is no um, one person who's ultimately accountable. I, you know, just to be clear, uh, just because I don't want Tom putting words in my mouth, um, so I wouldn't hold up New Orleans as the perfect example no, no, of it, no. just to be clear. No. Um, there are elements of what happens in New Orleans that make sense, some. Um, I, I'd add a couple of things. I'd say that, um, that clear lines of accountability are not always uh, the norm in traditional school districts. Um, I would also say that um, there is a great need for coordination of services, uh, specifically those things like transportation and safety, uh, but that uh, what is critical is the autonomy that schools have, uh, and you, I think Dan, you in some ways referred it to as innovation. Um, autonomy to decide on their own curriculum, to say we're going to go for a longer period of time to um, attract talent and entrepreneurial spirit to schools to be able to create the type of uh, successful cultures that we know um, uh, allow for great education to happen in schools. So autonomy being the linchpin. Okay, great. And so um, there's a few uh, uh, questions here from the audience that all involve um, uh, student responding to kind of student discipline uh, concerns in constructive ways, and so I'll read off uh, a few of them. What is the EAA doing to ensure that all students have access to education and in-class learning? We know that students with learning differences, low-income and minority students are suspended and expelled at disproportionate rates. What is EAA and charters, what are they doing to ensure that these students have uh, equal access to education? There was a related question um, that was referencing kind of some MDE, Michigan Department of Education policy um, uh, pushes to kind of have less punitive disciplinary measures. How is that playing out in charters and EAA? I'll 
I'll go first. Um, so I, we see a lot of that. We see a lot of students that come in and end up at our doors who have been uh, suspended or ex expelled from different schools in Detroit. Um, and we take um, all of those students in. Um, the, the goal is to ensure that there is safety in a school, but that we are um, doing it through restorative practices. So one of the things that we have done uh, that we just did with the new teachers that were hired this year was do an intensive training on restorative circles and how to de-escalate um, situations uh, of conflict in school without resorting to violence. So lots of those things are in place um, in EAA schools. But as I said, um, we, are, we certainly see a lot of suspended and expel students and accept them into, into uh, the EAA and find other wraparound services in counseling, et cetera, that need uh, to be in place for those students to be successful. Um, and a lot of it is just figuring out how to design how to design those services for them individually. Yeah, a couple of, a couple of things. We have a wonderful uh, special ed director, Tina Saunders, who's been in the city working for a long time, is doing amazing work. And the state average is, you know, in the 10 to 11 percent special ed population uh, as a percent of your overall body. And we're right at that um, level. In fact, our high school is over 20 percent. Um, so we very much uh, put a lot of effort and energy and, and the resources around that um, to support those students. And we also spend a lot of time, especially at the beginning of the year with our, with our high school students, trying to create that right culture and just to try to set the right expectations. Um, in fact, the first uh, two weeks of school, they didn't touch a computer. Um, they really didn't, because we have an extended school year as well, 200 days, we didn't have, um, get a whole lot of the curriculum. It was really around getting to know each other, building relationships, creating the right foundational that you need for the rest of the, the school year. And even with that, we had a student uh, just a couple weeks ago bring a gun to school, and some things are not um, up for debate. You know, the, the law is very clear um, that we only have certain choices uh, to deal with those sorts of situations. Uh, so really quickly, two things in response to this. One is, so I'm going to do uh, take panelist prerogative and ask, actually ask my colleague from the State Board of Education to raise her hand. Michelle, throw it up there. Michelle has been sitting on a task force on this very issue, um, uh, dealing with um, state discipline policy and kind of model policies around suspensions and expulsions and so on. And if you're interested in more information about state policy and potential direction in that regard, I would really encourage you to talk with Michelle. And I hope that's OK that I'm volunteering you that way. Um, uh, and if it's not, I'm going to run out of here really fast. <laughs> uh, second thing I would say, just from a personal perspective, um, you know, we, we it frequently in this space we talk about academic outcomes for kids, so on and so forth. Ex suspensions and expulsions, I mean, this is a critically important issue. So what actually drew me into this work, um, at the end of my legal career, I uh, was doing criminal defense work. I was at the Federal Defender Office, which is the public defender for folks accused of committing federal crimes, and um, sat in my office literally kind of witness to a parade of largely African American and Latino men uh, coming to my office accused of committing crimes that most of them had in fact committed. Um, this was in the mid-90s, who so had been failed by our education system or other systems, it wasn't just education, um, and were facing 10, 15, 20-year prison terms um, that would in many ways put their children on the exact same trajectory that they had been on. Like this is a vicious, horrible cycle that um, is morally and ethically inappropriate as well as financially burdensome for the entire state. It just has to get fixed. So, sorry for preaching. but. No, I'm not sorry for preaching. This, that was okay. <laughs> um, to me, uh, maybe kind of uh, you know related somewhat to that kind of the last uh, stream of uh, thoughts um, from the panelists. There are several several of the questions involve kind of parents and the larger community. So I want to kind of read off a few of these questions and have the panelists address them. One, I, f I feel like we're hearing about Detroit education in a vacuum. How can we ignore the pro profound poverty some of the students live in or the culture of violence they are immersed in? Uh, are great people and organi organized bus routes enough in such a setting? 
Uh, and then another related question. My question for Dan and the rest of the panel is, is the, uh, is that the fear of school choice, um, placing more of the responsibility of child outcomes on parents, um, picking and uh, um, navigating, finding the schools. Um, uh, uh, okay, so I think that's what I can get, and then, uh, another related question is um, to T Dan and Tom, how are you, and I would ask say Veronica could, could speak this well, how are you engaging parents and families um, either in your individual schools or for Dan and kind of the process that you're envisioning moving forward? So sociological context of poverty and education and then engagement um, of specific families in particular. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in on these too. Um, so I, I strongly believe that uh, the conditions around the school matter greatly. Um, this is, I don't, I don't mean to have this conversation in a vacuum and my apologies for kind of not highlighting that at the outset. Um, uh, I think these, this is a community challenge um, that has to be addressed community-wide. That having been said, schools are one of the few places where we are willing, that we believe so strongly in that we're willing to tax ourselves and publicly fund in order to like, try and resolve the challenge, right? So I think the schools have a unique, um, a, a uniquely, uh, kind of a unique role and unique possibilities around helping to remediate some of those other challenges, some of those socioeconomic and uh, societal and, and uh, uh, community-wide challenges. Um, and so we've got to get schools performing at as high a level as possible. Um, now that, frequently that conversation kind of sounds stark and uh, uh, really confrontational and oppositional for teachers. I want to be clear, part of what I am proposing is a a system, a governance system that would allow, right, for greater supports for teachers. More money in the classroom, more money in districts, more stable infrastructure, so on and so forth. Um, uh, so all that other context does matter, to be clear. Two, um, around choice and kind of markets treating um, families, particularly low-income families, unfairly. Hear that loud and clear, like I'm a dem at, at, at the root of it all, right? Um, and an unregulated marketplace does create that possibility for sure. Like that's what's happening in Detroit right now. If you're a connected family, you can game the system and you can get entry to the school of your choice. If you're not a connected family, you can't. Creating real transparency and regulation around choice, right, would resolve that problem. And if we're not gonna fix housing patterns, I would submit that choice is the next, school choice is the next best mechanism that we have for helping kids growing up in low income families and communities escape the cycle of poverty that we all know exists. Um, lastly, uh, uh, so regulated choice I think can make choice fair to parents uh, and, low in, um, and low income families. Lastly, engaging parents and families. So we do um, quite a bit, probably the, um, and I'll just talk really quickly about engaging teachers as well. Uh, our scorecard on school performance um, actually includes uh, the five essential survey out of the University of Chicago. So we pay for the surveying of every teacher and every student fourth grade and higher in Detroit as part of the generation of the scorecard. Um, we'd love to do that for parents as well, but getting parent response rates to that tool high enough to actually make it a useful tool is a nearly impossible um, task, at least to date. I, don't, I actually don't believe many things are impossible. We just haven't figured out the right way to do it yet. Um, we also do unannounced site visits to schools um, in order to help parents, one, get vis visibility to lots of schools, right? It, the notion of choice is much more effective when you can actually compare A and B. Um, it also changes the relationship that the school has with the community, right? So like folks should be able to come and check me out and check out the school, so on and so forth. So parents and community members develop their own rubric around what's important in schools, safety, cleanliness, student work displayed on the walls, working toilets, whatever it is. Um, and those items they assess for as they go to school buildings unannounced throughout Detroit, all schools, EAA, charter, and DPS. So that's part of what we do around engagement. Um. I'll start on the poverty question, and yes, I, I completely agree, it's, it's a real issue. 
Uh, and, I'll, and I'll go a little broader than, uh, than Detroit and go from my experience in New York City for, for over a decade being there. So what happens in our um, schools in our poorest neighborhoods? Um, our schools in our poorest neighborhoods have less money, generally, uh, have the least experienced teachers and least uh, effective teachers, uh, generally have unstable leadership, uh, we, have, we see high turnover rates of principals in our most struggling schools. Um, and we don't have high expectations for students. And I would submit that that is probably the case in some, some of the challenges that we see in Detroit. Um, so how, how do we go about fixing those major, uh, major challenges? I think um, they are deeply, deeply tied with poverty. Um, but we see examples all over the country of um, innovative, strong cultures uh, doing incredible, schools doing incredible things with students um, despite all of that because they're addressing some of these issues. Having the right level of resources, having experienced um, uh, effective teachers in, in all classrooms doing the type of work to support and improve teachers over time, uh, creating strong cultures and setting high expectations for students. And I think um, that we see uh, that we see that happening in a number of different places and we see that happening in a couple of places in Detroit as well. We need more of it. I don't know that I have a whole lot to add. I think you know we we're in this every day, so we we um, we know that the poverty is very real and very challenging. In our schools, it's 80 plus percent, you know, free and reduced lunch, meaning the high poverty levels, um, and it's it's a reality. But it can't become an excuse, and is kind of our motto. So um, you just have to acknowledge it and keep the the focus on high expectations, and ultimately do all the basic blocking and tackling really well. Um, which is which is very hard to do. Okay, now uh, a few questions I've been reminded, you know, a number of these questions I've asked before have come in on Twitter. I'm supposed to say that. I'm not sure why, actually, but um, <laughs> so some of them have come in on Twitter. One in this group has, uh, one of the group that I'm going to read now is a Twitter question. Uh, okay, so the, I, these next set of questions really, I think, challenge like the paradigm that all three of you kind of have embraced to one extent or another of a choice at heart based system um, uh, that really this is the right structure. So in 1990, I'm just gonna read a few of the questions off. In 1990, there were 100 Michigan districts scoring below DPS and MEEP scores. Since reforms such as the growth of charters, EAA, takeovers, et cetera, scores have plummeted. The city also went from a healthy surplus to deep in debt. How can we say that charters, uh, EAA, and all these, these kind of choice-based reforms uh, have not completely failed. Um, how about tax, another question, how about taxpayer choice? Don't Michigan citizens uh, um, uh, have choice not to, to uh, profitize Michigan education? I think that's a reference to for-profit uh, charter operators. Um, School choice often looks like business interests being prioritized over student interests. What measures do you suggest to maintain an environment where families have options, yet children don't uh, take second place to what works well for the service providers? So what, what evidence is that this whole paradigm actually is worth trying to pursue? Um, what, sorry. I, I, so I actually hear that question as being a little different. Um, I, there's, a re, there's a remarkable supply of evidence that the paradigm as pursued in Michigan and Detroit does not work, um, I would argue, right? I don't think that's an indictment of, um, of other paradigms that are similarly different from the traditional. Just, but um, just to clear, you're saying there's evidence that the old kind of DPS-centric paradigm wasn't working, or the current charters, EAA? Uh, both. Both, okay. Both. Um, there's an ample supply of evidence that neither 
um, is working, neither worked well, neither, the old paradigm didn't work well um, and was increasingly not working well as Detroit got poorer and blacker, um, quite honestly. Uh, and that the new paradigm does not work well in Detroit either. I think there's an ample supply of both. Uh, um, that having been said, I, so, so I, I always enter this conversation from, so what can we do to make it work today? So given the conditions that exist today, like what conditions have to be changed today to make it work, right? Um, kind of politics aside, what conditions could be changed to make it work today? And I believe that there are a set of them that could be changed that would actually give it a much, much better chance of working, many of which I outlined uh, for you um, in my 15 minutes. Um, a common enrollment and transportation system actually does make choice equitable for families. Um, uh, in a way that it's not when you don't have common choice and common enrollment, a common enrollment window, transportation systems, and the so on. Um, uh, I, so the, uh, there's a kind of second strain, strain to this question having to do with the privatization of education, kind of the for-profit uh, enterprise playing a role in all of this, so on and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of that, just to be clear. Uh, it, it, that actually shows up, I think, in the real estate portion of this game. I mean, if you actually look at how that works, it's the real estate portion. It's not educate. It's like not, it's not the teaching and learning that is making you know national heritage a lot of money. It's the real estate game, right? Where you buy the facility and you lease it to the school, and you're able to pay it off in ten years, and then the rest of it is gravy. I, I, I you know, I, so let's be clear. Like, so their schools happen to be. Um, among the higher performing in Detroit, ironically, right? Um, and we don't want to take that away from those kids and so on and so forth. But why are we, what, tell, somebody explain to me again why we have educators involved in real estate? Like what, what, somebody, somebody, anybody, explain to me why it makes sense to have professional educators charged with dealing with real estate? Anybody. It's not a rhetorical question. Like so, so I, so I think the I think we mix burdens when we talk about the privatization of education and the for-profit motive and so on. Take the profit elements out of the game, is is my solution to that at at the at the base level, right? And then if politically speaking, we believe that we should not have for-profit schools and great, like I believe in democracy, like let's actually put that up for like let's talk about that publicly and have a vote about that um, if that's the you know, if, if that's an issue that needs to be wrestled with. But in the meantime, let's get real estate and all of that, get that, that mess isn't, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Get it out of education, it doesn't make any sense. Other thoughts on the, we got I don't that point? feel strongly about any of this. No, I don't. <laughs> that's why we like you. We gotta, we gotta stop letting him go first. <laughs> um, so first of all, we are a nonprofit um, management company that runs our, our schools. Maybe that's why I was invited today. Um, I, I don't actually don't have uh, too much of an issue with the, the for-profit world. I think um, you know, most folks are pretty entrenched on this topic. Um, and they, they seek out uh, opinions and articles and data that supports what they already believe. And so it's unfortunate because it creates um, not a whole lot of productive conversations that ultimately our kids are watching and saying, is this how we're supposed to act when we, when we grow up? Um, we, we think that the, the, the topic is just so complex. Um, when I worked at Intel, making the, the most advanced computer chips in the world, uh, that was easy, because we had a, a system, a process, an equation, a formula behind every single one of those chips. Every day you know, in the space of this, this world called education is different, um, and the politics is is raging out of out of control. So it's just an, it's an, an infinitely complex, and it's so easy to to paint uh, broad strokes over the topic to say that charter schools are bad or uh, you know et cetera et cetera. And I just don't think it's very very productive. Um, there are a lot of good uh, for profit uh, management companies that are getting good results. And um, if I think if we stay focused on what's working for students, there's a th those, those parents are choosing that school and, and they're happy with it. Um, and so um, we need to, I think we need to, in many ways, move, move beyond that. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I think um, it's, a, it's a very interesting time. I think, I think Dan's right that a lot of this stuff is gonna shake out um, in one way or another because there's so much attention on it right now. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it does and hopefully it's in, it's in productive ways. 
Um, my my perspective is um, uh, the EAA uh, are not uh, it's not a private entity. It is a governmental entity. So let me say that to start with. Um, and the second is uh, with a robust accountability system, you could um, really focus on um, uh, closing down or moving out uh, bad actors. Um, and uh, without it, you can't. And so for me, that is where uh, we can make the most difference um, by really truly evaluating what is going on and uh, moving uh, firmly ahead to move out any bad actors that exist. Um, privatization has been going on in traditional public schools for a long time. I had multi, I've managed multi-million dollar contracts in New York City public schools with textbook providers and all sorts of other entities that were private and so uh, you know, this, this concept of privatization is, is an interesting topic, but I think um, looked at from one lens and not sort of the broader lens. We've been, you know, using uh, private entities to service and support our schools for a long time. So, uh, a few questions now kind of uh, are going to ask the panelists to focus um, specifically on DPS. So, and of course, one of them is from Twitter. Um, how does DPS fit into the conversation? Um, is the goal to, then another one, is the goal to replace the Detroit public school system or restore the system? Uh, so where, where does DPS fall in all of these conversations? Veronica, why don't we start with you? <laughs> um, well, I think for the EAA, DPS is a critical partner. They are part of the entity that created the EAA. Um, I think, um, I, as I said, I've come from a school district where we had a traditional public school uh, system running and a robust charter sector running. And those two things, um, t when running uh, in tandem, uh, tend to elevate each other's performance. Um, so that's the system that I'm familiar with. Um, I, I, I don't have any particular perspective on that, but I, I do believe that um, that having the opportunity to have multiple uh, parties and multiple entities in this work um, just improves our, our work altogether. Yeah, I would ditto that. I think, in fact, uh, Dan and I, uh, before Veronica moved to town, we worked on an initiative with several charters with Excellent Schools Detroit, the EAA, and DPS. And it was all around this notion of, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. So how do we focus on Detroit as a as a city and not on, on our own kind of turf within that um, and in a, in, a, in a grant that we were going out after collectively on the national level. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done there, but I, I hope that DPS is uh, a player you know, for a long time to come. Uh, and I, so I would agree. I think um, Detroit Public Schools has to be a part of the um, future public education system in Detroit, or one of the public education systems in Detroit. Um, I think that it, like ev that bus, like all the buses on the road, needs to be accountable to a larger coherent strategy. Um, uh, so the goal isn't to replace DPS at all. Um, I, and I would say too, so I didn't say this, I, I shortened my deck quite a bit uh, for today, that part of, the, part of what has to happen going forward in Detroit, um, and I probably, this needed to stay in, is that the debt that DPS is carrying has to be resolved. Um, you just, you can't, we are ultimately, um, so that debt is being paid, right? It's being paid by kids um, who aren't able to get the same level of resources that they would be able to get if DPS was not carrying that debt. It's ultimately an obligation of the state. Um, I mean, the state constitution requires that the state provide education uh, to every child in the state, a free access, whatever the language is, uh, public education. The state's got to figure it out. Um, uh, if, and uh, you know, so like Jack Martin, and he's personally, he's a nice guy, and I think it's pretty clear after six years, frankly, that the emergency manager system is not resolving the deficit situation in Detroit. I, I just think it's clear we can refinance to long-term debt and kick the can down the road, but it's not ultimately fixing the problem. 
um, that debt has to be resolved if we are serious about educating the 47, 50,000 kids, whatever it is, um, that attend Detroit public schools. And so I know uh, we actually have a few of the panelists have to leave right away. So I, you know, I see it's 5.30 now. So I want to uh, stop here on that uh, you know, optimistic note of Detroit's debt and um, <laughs> uh, thank uh, all three panelists uh, for joining us today and for some uh, interesting and stimulating remarks. Uh, I hope to see all of you at other uh, EPI events and other events specifically on education in Detroit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs>